Hello and welcome to this next video uh, on a single population mean or hypothesis test on a single population mean. Uh, this is the second one we've done. So I think this time I'll probably go through the process a little bit faster and just kind of go through step by step how to do it uh, rather than dwell too, too much on um, really the, the why and how everything is working and we'll just kind of go through it. So let's, uh, let's get into this exercise. So here we have an instructor at your university has produced a series of videos, a series, a series of problems and accompanying videos. Sounds familiar, I guess. Uh, in hopes of improving a student's understanding of the course. Having taught the course many times, he's calculated the overall average to be 71% and the population standard deviation is 12 percentage points. At the end of the following semester, his class of 40 students, sounds like a sample size, who had access to the video walkthroughs had an average grade of 74.6%. So, using a level of significance of 0 0.05, test to determine whether or not this shows an improvement. Okay, so the very first thing that we need to do here, formulate the null and alternative. So I'll just write this down, our null, here's our alternative. We're testing a population mean, so this is letter mu. Now, here the problem tells us we're doing a one-tail test, so we can ignore the possibility of a two-tail test. We know it's not that. So the challenge here is to determine, well, is this a lower tail or is it an upper tail test? There's always clues in the problem somewhere. Uh, so if you go through this exercise, you'll see the clue is right in that very last sentence. It tells us what it is to test. Test to determine whether or not this shows an improvement over the historical average. So I want to see is the new population mean, is it greater than the historical average? So that's going to be reflected in my alternative hypotheses, 0.71, so 71%. This is the purpose of the research, this is why we're doing this exercise, and so that reasoning, that reason why I'm doing the exercise, I want to be able to show this. I want to be able to show, is there, uh, is, has the mean gone above, is it greater than 0.71? So that's reflected in the alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis captures every other possibility. So the alternative, if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, then we can say that yes, the average grade has improved. Uh, if the evidence supports the null hypothesis, then no, we have failed uh, these video walkthroughs. There's no evidence that they've had any positive impact on student outcomes. So there's my null and alternative, and that's my justification. Now, next step here. So we have our level of significance is 0.05. So don't forget what that means. This means our tolerance towards committing a type one error. So I'm comfortable with a 5% chance uh, of rejecting the null hypotheses, even if it happens to be true. Now, of course, we don't know that it's gonna be true. If we knew that, we wouldn't have to do the test. So we'll never know if we've committed one. All this is saying is that I'm comfortable with the 5% chance that maybe I'll incorrectly reject that null hypothesis. So calculate our test statistic. Okay, so we're doing a Z test. So we need this formula here. And we have all of the bits of information. Uh, here's my sample mean here. So I'll, I always like to keep things in decimal format rather than as a percentage. I think it's a little bit easier to work with. So 0 0.7461 minus 0.71. And here's that standard deviation, it's 0.12 divided by the square root of, we have 40 over here. Okay, now let's get that calculator out. 0.746 minus 0.71 divided by 0.12 over root 40 close that bracket, equal, and I get, let's round that to about 1.9, 1.90. Okay, so there's our test statistic, 1.90. Use the p-value approach to draw your conclusion. Okay, so now we need to go to our tables and calculate the probability that corresponds to that. So just very quickly, here's what we're doing. This is that hypothesis under the assumption that the null is true. Here from there, uh, this was 0.71. From there, we took a sample with a mean of 0.746. We standardized that into a z-score. 
that now we know here has a value of 1.90. So now we want to find the p-value. So in this case, for our one-tailed test, and this is an upper-tailed test, so that p-value is going to be in the upper tail of the distribution. So what I want to do is calculate the area under the tail uh, right, sorry, under the curve uh, in the upper side, the right hand side of that distribution. So if we go to our z tables, I'm looking for z of 1.90. Now keep in mind, we've worked with these tables before, uh, keep in mind how they're designed. Here I've got uh, only the lower tail probability. If I go to the positive side, same thing. I have that lower tail probability. And so if I were to look up 1.9, so there's 1.90, so that gives me a probability of 0.9713. So that's this whole region here, 0.9713 that corresponds with a test statistic of 1.9. But of course, this is an upper tail test that we're doing. So what I want is this region to the right of 1.9. So I can either calculate 1 minus 0.9713, and that's going to give me, let's do this real quick, 1 minus 0.9713, 0 0.027. Is that right? I feel like I'm missing a decimal. 0 0.287. 0 0.0287 is that upper tail. Or again, we can take advantage of the symmetry of this distribution. And if we look up the negative of our test statistic, so here's negative 1.90. And so that gives us, well, there it is exactly the same value, 0 0.0287. So that's giving us this area to the left of negative 1.9. Even though our true test statistic is positive 1.9, this area here is going to be exactly equal to this area here. So I'm only using this trick because of this is how the tables happen to be uh, designed. So. Uh, that's about all there is to it. So now we have our p-value 0 0.20287. If I come back here, I have here's that p-value 0 0.0287. So what this tells us now, this is really the measure of evidence that we have, uh, the measure, the magnitude of the evidence uh, against the, in this case, it's against the null hypotheses. I say that because it's very small. Keep in mind that when we're performing these tests, we are always under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true unless we have evidence to show otherwise. Well, now here's that evidence that in this case shows otherwise. What this means is that if the null is true, uh, the, the possibility of obtaining a sample with a mean of 0.746, it's possible. The probability is not equal to zero, it's possible, but it's extremely unlikely. Uh, so unlikely, in fact, that I'm going to, in this case, reject my null hypotheses. So by rejecting, if, I, if this is my decision, my conclusion, I say I'm going to reject, I'm either correct or I've committed a type 1 error. Now, the possibility of committing a type 1 error, that's dependent on this p-value. The fact that this p-value is so small, it means that this sample mean, it's possible, but very unlikely. So if I reject, it's possible that I've committed a type 1 error, but very unlikely. So given that our level of significance here is 0 0.05, my tolerance towards a type 1 error is 5%, this p-value is less than 5%, so my risk, by rejecting, my risk of committing a type 1 error here is less than my tolerance towards committing a type 1 error, uh, then that means I'm comfortable rejecting at the 0.05 level of significance. I have sufficient evidence uh, to support the alternative hypotheses. Okay, uh, so let's move on. Part D, uh, verify our conclusion with the critical value approach. So all this means now is we're going to go to our tables 
and find what is that critical value that defines that rejection space. So in other words, I want to find that Z value that corresponds with our alpha, which is 0 0.05. So that Z value that will give me 0 0.05 in that upper tail. And then we can apply the rejection rule that if my test statistic is larger than that critical value, then we can reject. And we'll always get exactly the same results uh, or conclusion using the p-value approach or the critical value approach. So let's go quickly to our Z tables. And now I want to look up Z alpha, which is Z 0 0.05. And again, I want this area in the upper tail to be 0 0.05. Oops, not 0, 0, 0.05. But if I go to the positive side, if I'm looking for something up here, and I want a positive test statistic because that's where my rejection space is, well, I'm not going to find anything even remotely close to 0 0.05 in this table. So what I'm going to do is take advantage of the symmetry of this table again and find some critical value that gives me a probability in the lower tail equal to 0 0.05. I know that that's going to be negative, but if I take the positive of it, it would be exactly the same in absolute value. It would be the same in magnitude. Uh, as the one that gives me 0 0.05 in that upper tail. So if we go through our table, uh, I find it right in here. It's actually right between these two. So I know that it's going to be 1.6. And then I want the second decimal place. Well, the second decimal place is between 0.04 and 0.05. It's going to be right in here, which is going to be 0.045. So that gives me that critical value of 1.645. So if I come back here, this critical value is 1.645. My test statistic is beyond that. It's further out into the tail than that. So again, this gives me uh, sufficient evidence to reject my null hypotheses. So our conclusion or our interpretation, I should say. Well, all of the evidence here supports the alternative, meaning that the evidence uh, shows that there has been an improvement uh, in average performance uh, in this course. Hopefully it's attributable to the videos, and maybe it's actually not, but all we can say is uh, this gives us evidence that the average has gone up. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. I hope that that was helpful. Okay, bye-bye.